Hey all, Ron here from Military Images Magazine with a new episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail. Today, we're going to Georgia, where Major General William Tecumseh Sherman and his U.S. Army, the Tennessee, had made deep inroads into the northern part of the state during the spring and the early summer of 64. By late July, they had partially invested Atlanta. Confederate soldiers did their best to hold the city, digging into a maze of trenches and other defensive positions and works as the Federals inched closer and closer to taking the city day by day. While this drama was playing out in the sultry summer sun, Georgians in the southern part of the state mobilized for the very real possibility that Sherman's army might in fact, take Atlanta, if they did, where they'd go next was really anybody's guess. About 90 miles south of the embattled, beleaguered city of Atlanta in Talbot County, the officer pictured here, Captain William Wimberly, received orders from the state of Georgia's adjutant general to report to his home county and mobilize local recruits and conscripts to prepare for the inevitable, inevitable to prepare for whatever scenario might befall them. Now, Wimberly was an excellent choice to defend his home county. He was not a stranger to organizing soldiers. In fact, he had served as an officer with an infantry regiment earlier in the war. His military story begins back in the spring of 1861, just after Fort Sumter, when he left his wife, his two daughters, and about 20 enslaved people on his family plantation and joined a local militia company. It's called the Southern Rifles. That militia company, sworn into Confederate service as Company A of the 4th Georgia Infantry. Wimberly, served as first lieutenant for a one-year term. The regiment went up to Virginia and saw very little enemy action. After his term expired in the spring of 1862, Wimberly could have elected to stay and remain in Virginia and fight, but he made a different decision. He decided not to re-enlist, and in his resignation letter, he cites his age, he was 35 years old, as a factor. Illness, which struck down so many soldiers, may also have played a role in that decision because he had spent about a month in the regimental hospital suffering from a fever. So Wimberly's resignation was accepted and he returned to his home in Georgia. Later that year, his health had improved and had been mostly restored he rejoined the army and served in several militia organizations in Georgia, including captain of Company F of the 3rd Georgia Infantry. In fact, he belonged to this regiment in that fateful summer of 1864 when Sherman was closing in on Atlanta and he received orders to mobilize his men as the precarious situation and Atlanta was growing worse day by day. Wimberly went home to Talbot County, followed his orders, and mobilized as many able-bodied boys and men as he could find. Now, Will, while Wimberly and his townspeople did their best to prepare for who knows what, Sherman's army captured Atlanta. Sherman paused to take stock of this situation, and eventually, as you students of the Civil War know, he set his sights on taking the city of Savannah, marching all the way across Georgia. Now, for Wimberly and his ragtag band of militiamen, this development was really nothing short of a disaster. They were facing the ruin of their homes, the loss of all they held dear, and even possibly their lives, because although they were full of fighting spirits and they had an advantage of a sense because they were standing to defend their homes, there was no way that they were going to be able to 
muster the manpower and the resources to take on the well-stocked, the well-fed, and the hungry for action army of Sherman as they were moving through the Georgia countryside. So Sherman and that well-prepared army began the operation that became known as the March to the Sea. That was on November 15th of 1864. So Sherman's forces began to held, head south from Atlanta. And it's about a week later that they meet their first stiff resistance. And that happens near the village of Griswoldsville, which is a bit of an industrial town. It's about 70 miles due west of Talbot County, about 90 miles south of Atlanta. On November 21st, 1864, Union Cavalry, led by General Hugh Judson Kilpatrick, he's known as Kill Cavalry Kilpatrick, raided Griswoldsville, capturing an enemy military supply train that the Confederates could just flat out not afford to lose. And to make matters worse, they burned a railroad station and several of the factory buildings in town. Early the next morning, a detachment of Confederate troopers under General Joe Wheeler struck back. The Yankee cavalry counterattacked and pushed Wheeler's boys back. By this time, Union infantry, a whole brigade, had arrived on the scene. They were accompanied by artillery, and they pushed all the Confederates back through Griswoldsville. While this drama was playing out in the factory and the railroad station at Griswoldsville, three brigades of Georgia militia arrived on the scene. That includes Wimberley and his Talbot County men. Those Georgia brigades formed in three compact lines, charged, and were met by devastating canister fire from the Union field cannon. The Georgians fell back. They attempted another deadly assault, and then another assault. And then they checked out the flanks, thinking that they might try to get around the Union army, but they realized that it was impossible. And they fell back, and the remnants of them that remained withdrew from the field. Wimberley, the Talbot County boys, and the other Georgians, they did what they could. And they slowed, but they could not stop Sherman's forces. The casualty lists were lopsided. On the Union side, 94 men were killed, wounded, or missing. On the Confederate side, 1,123. That's more than 1,000 additional more Confederate casualties in Union. Among them, among the wounded, was Wimberley. He was hit three times. Once in the arm, once in the leg, and once in the thigh. Somehow, he managed to escape and made his way home. He rejoined his family. The war finally ends, and he resumes his livelihood as a farmer without the enslaved people. He lived a relatively long life, dying at age 69 in 1895. That was nine years before the unveiling of a monument in his home county, dedicated to him and others who defended their state. So thanks for listening. We'll see you on the next episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail.